In this, the first of a new series, we're going to learn how to build and the principles of an 8-bit microcomputer system. Roll the titles. Is that it? <sighs> Welcome to Extronical. So, you might be wondering why I'm looking at building an 8-bit system when there are other systems available already, such as the Gigatron, there's an Apple II and an Apple I remake. There's also, if you watch the 8-bit guy, he's working on the Commander X16 with some others, which is uh, quite an advanced 8-bit based sort of system. So why am I doing it? Well, primarily, it's education. The principles that we'll learn over this series of episodes stand for not just 8-bit systems, but for modern computers as well. The principles have not changed. So, for example, we've got a processor there, we've got some RAM um, in this box, we'll open up in a bit, we've got some ROM. In the series, we'll learn about the hardware, such as the processor, memory, memory decoding, clocks, talking to peripherals, the principles of a good operating system, etc, etc. So I'm going to set myself three levels of challenge for this project. The first is the bronze, and with the bronze level, we'll have a running system with a basic operating system, some simple I.O., and perhaps some simple sound. With the silver, we'll have a simple display, a keyboard, some sort of storage. We'll have improved the operating system so we can handle the storage in the keyboard, etc. When we get to the gold level of this design, when we've got that far, I'm hoping I'll have bitmap graphics, improved multi-channel sound, using a proper sound chip, probably, possibly, it might be something more bespoke, I'm not quite sure. We'll add in some, we'll hopefully add in some standard basic, the actual language basic, perhaps Microsoft basic. So we might just not write his own basic, that's far too big a task, but we might get an implementation of basic running our system, such as Microsoft basic was one of the main ones back then that was bought in by various manufacturers. We'll add a sort of some sort of standard disk operating system. We'll add more memory than the processor should take using a technique called bank switching, which we'll go into, which was heavily used and uh, is still used uh, nowadays in various systems depending on their limitations. And we'll also look at what video RAM is and how you can access RAM and what makes, what makes it video RAM, what doesn't make it video RAM. So, what will we need? We will need the processor. Now, I've worked, I've coded an assembler on a lot of processors. I'll see if I can remember all or most of them. I've programmed on 6809, a bit like a forerunner to the 6502. I've programmed heavily on the 6502, a lot of experience on that, which that is, that is a 6502 processor, which we're going to use. I've programmed on Z80, and I've done quite a lot of ARM assembler, not for many years, I'm talking decades now, uh, but I have done a lot of ARM assembler as well, and I've done some 886, you know, PC assembler as well. I've done a heck of a lot of assembler over the years. So, we'll be using 6502, two reasons. As you just heard, I am very, very familiar with it. And secondly, it's a really simple processor. There's very little internals in this as, as, as with regards to what we call registers. Very simple to understand. The Z80 is arguably more powerful than 6502. Gosh, this was an argument that was had back in the day. Um, horses for courses with them, really. Whatever you're deciding to do, the Z80 would, could be more suitable, or sometimes it's 502, could be more suitable, depending on what you're doing. So we'll be using that. The, this is RAM, and my intention is that if you want to follow along and build what I'm building, you should be able to, because although some of these parts are new, and some are older stock, they will be still available. So I bought these as five, this is the 622, uh, sorry, 6256 chip, and it's basically a 256 kilobit chip. And if you divide that by 8 for bytes, that works out at 32 kilobytes. Now, if when I come to put this video together, you can't no longer, you can no longer easily get that. You're certainly not making it new anymore, but if you can't eat, I don't think they are anyway. If you can't easily get it, I will find some sort of alternative that should work. In here, we've got the ROM. Now, Back in when I used to last do this, which as I said is some years ago, we used EEPROMs, of which I do have an example somewhere off camera. There we go. 
So an EEPROM was an elect was an EEPROM was an erasable programmable read-only memory. So it was read-only memory it means when the power was taken off, the contents of that memory would stay. And the actual chip silicon's there, and you'd shine an ultraviolet light on it for about 20 minutes, depending on how intense the light was, to actually erase it, and then you could reprogram it. These, um, I was going to kind of go down this route actually. A couple of reasons I'm not. First of all, really hard to get hold of, and certainly the programmers for these and the eraser, UV erasers are certainly not easy, uh, readily available anymore. Also, yeah, 20 minutes to erase one of them is a right pain when you've made a, a bug in your code and you've got to quickly change it and put it back in. So, yeah, yeah, I won't be going back to them. These are, are they the same size as that EEPROM? Are they a bit bigger? Yeah, they're the same size, which is not a shocker. I think they're almost pin compatible for that particular EEPROM. That's, uh, I can't read it. It's probably a 2.7 something or other. Can't read but these EEPROMs are, if you want to play along at home, the, let's get them out of the packet, might be a little bit easier to read. Come on, out you come. These are 128C2, C256, and made by Atmel. And yeah, I'm pretty sure I bought these new. I think these are still made and readily available, if I can remember. And the reason I'm a bit flaky in my memory, I bought all this stuff about a year ago. I was doing this project a long time ago, but other things got in the way. Etc. Et I can't be getting them back in there, can I? I can't be bothered with that. Other things got in the way, so the project has just been shelved for some time. So the basics you need to run a computer system are the processor, some RAM, some ROM. Obviously, there's additional components such as a clock generator to make the, give, it, give the system its heartbeat. And also we'll need some, well, here we are, I've got a lot of this, glue logic to sort of like, call it glue logic or... I'll talk about them all, but yeah, we've got a lot of that. This is all old stock for what I've had from years ago. This is left over from when I used to build these systems. And there are various TTL logic gates. And I think they're one of the exclusively old logic gates here. I don't remember them, but let's have a look at some of the date codes on them. What's this? Uh, 273, 74273 LS. Ooh, was that a buffer transceiver? I can't, I can't remember, but we'll go through, through, through these and why you need them. Possibly it was, can't remember. What's that date called? That's the 17th week, 1986. That's showing my age a bit. Although some of these are older than when I used to work on the system. That's got a bent leg there. Some of these are older than when I used to work on the systems, obviously, because you buy chips and sometimes they're actually several years old when you buy them. So yeah, doesn't mean I was working on these in 86. Maybe I'm not that old. What's this one? Do we have a date code on that? Not that I can easily spot anyway anymore. 47th week, 1984, truth. Gosh, some of these are old. There must be a more modern one somewhere. 87, anyway, they're all old. They're all old stock that I've got in. Now, when I come to use these, if I do reuse some of these, if they are difficult to get hold of now, I will source a different part so that people can still play along at home if they want to. So we've got that, so I'm gonna write messy. I'm gonna have to clean this up later on. Get it over there. Also, we might need some other additional chips, these are other ones, these are ones I just found in my parts, and these are what I've got left from a long time ago, there's EEPROM so early, I think there's another EEPROM in here somewhere, where is it? Sure there is, sure I had another EEPROM somewhere, there it is, I thought I'd see one earlier, get over there you. So various chips I've, um, from when I was developing uh, uh, embedded systems a long time ago, we've got uh, 6522, which is actually all the peripheral interface uh, adapter for the 6502 is their sort of sister chip. This is what you'd use to deal with your input and output. So it could drive better and higher currents than the processor, obviously. But even then, it wasn't terrifically high. Still need a bit of buffering. But yeah, that's the one you want to use when you're dealing with I.O. Such as keyboards or other things. So what else we got? MZ EEPROMs. What's this? Another 6522. Then we've got some 8257. 8255, oh, I can't remember what they were. One of these is a DMA, a direct memory access chip. I think it's a, oh, my memory. I think it's the 8255, uh, or it's 85. I'm pretty sure it's 8255, which I've got two. If it is, I can't remember what the 257's for. I'll put up on screen now, whichever way around it is and whichever one is. But a DMA was something, these were often used with Z80s. As it happens, that they were sort of like almost a sister to the Z80 chip. At least the Z80 supported, well, not supported, but they could be used with them. These are a lot quicker. They literally access memory directly, ignoring the process. In fact, stopping the process from accessing memory itself. 
these will do a job of mass moving memory blocks around. They would go at a speed, well, I'll go into it in later episodes, at probably 10 to 20 times faster than the processor could move that log, that memory around. This could do it much faster, which is why you'd use them. Uh, early things called blitter chips, used on the, I think the Amiga had a blitter chip, didn't it? And other systems did. Uh, we used to move graphics around really quickly in order the process. Again, we'll go into whichever. What else we got? 85 one, 85 one, got a few of these. 85 one, three of them. Pretty sure uh, they're serial chips. So when you're talking about the RS232 interface, RS423 interface, uh, they were where you'd go with. You would also need a support chip, uh, which would buffer to the outside world, if I remember right. They don't think this is the buffer chip. I think that was the actual serial chip for handling the sort of handling the serial communications in and out of the computer. And we may or may not be using that. So that's kind of what we're using. Uh, Support-wise, other things you'll need. Obviously, you're going to need some sort of things to stick it on. And I'm going to build it on a breadboard, like that. I'm going to put the processor on, and I'm probably going to make the whole thing on a board as well, the breadboard on a board. We're also going to use one of these zero insertion sockets for when we're programming the memory. So that's plugged into your circuit board. That is called zero insertion force, if you didn't know, because it really takes no force at all to pop that in. So that's in your circuit, you put that down, and that's now engaged in your circuit. You can run and test your code, may or maybe, maybe or maybe it does not work. And then when you want to reprogram it, flip the switch up, grab it out, pop it in your programmer. Talking of which, we'll need a programmer. So this is a very common programmer. These are, as again, I bought it about a year ago, but they're really cheap. Came with this, like a connecting USB lead, um, sort of a chip pullery type, what is that? No, I'm not entirely sure what that is. Lots of adapter boards for programming various memory chips, so it will program a vast amount of different ones. So anyway, I'll put links in uh, down below. There'll be some affiliate links and there'll be some non-affiliate links. Depends whether I can get stuff on Amazon or not. So a lot of stuff might not be on Amazon. This would be. And I've just lost the chip, haven't I? Where's that chip gone that, that was there? Where, where would I just put that? And I've just lost it. Never mind, we'll find out later. You're not going to get hold of a 6502 processor new. That's something you're not going to do. There's mine. But I kept it in that case, I can, and I can find it easily. Um, they've been stopped being made a long time ago. You might get a second-hand one, or like this, this is a new one. It's a, a W6502. And I believe these are still being made new, or at least there is still old new stock available. And I think this can go up to 16 megahertz, whereas most of the 6502s from back in the day ran at about 2 megahertz. It started off about 1, I think, and then they got that speed up and it went up to 2 megahertz. But I think that was the sort of speed cap of the processor back then. But this one, I think, will run up to 16. And we'll certainly will be setting it so we can actually run it at maybe 2, 4, 8, 16 megahertz. So thanks very much. You've made it to the end of this rather waffly first introduction video, just getting explaining what we're going to be doing. I'll get the next episode out as quick as I can. But if you like this so far, then hit the thumbs up. Thanks very much. If you'd like to subscribe and not subscribe, then have a go at that. If you'd like to watch me on Odyssey, this film, will, this film, this video will be available on Odyssey as well. There are links down below to join Odyssey if you want. And there's also, as I said, affiliate links down below for various parts that you might need if you want to follow along. Thanks very much to my patrons. Always appreciate the effort that people go to to support the channel. So until next time, thanks very much for watching. Cheerio. Thank you.